<clears throat> pardon my voice. I didn't want to call Pastor Renee and say, I'm sick, you're going to have to preach, because you know Pastor Renee preached when he was sick too. <laughs> and so Pastor Jennifer has to preach too. <clears throat> um, so my voice sounds a little bit funny, but that's okay. We'll, we will we'll get through it all right with your grace. Thank you. Um, <laughs> We're going to change focus just a little bit. If you were in the first service, and I know that some of you were, don't tell your neighbor what we're going to do next. This is an interactive message uh, this morning, so we're going to be doing some things together. And uh, I want to, uh, before we click anything on the slide, uh, ushers, if you'll come forward. And um, would you pass this to everybody, please? Thank you. If you were in the first service and you say, I've already received one, I've already talked with one person who said, I received one, but I didn't quite like what was, I'm going to do it again. So you're welcome to do it again. Or if you were in the first service, you can, uh, you can just keep what you had. Please don't be discouraged by the piece of paper you've received. I know, Maui's thinking, what? <laughs> okay, um, as you're receiving it now. Uh, what do we have? What are you receiving right now? This is what you're receiving. We have a very optimistic brother here who says, I see this flower right back here. <laughs> and that, that is surely part of it. That's surely part of it. Um, what you have here is a tombstone. You say, well, they don't look like that in my country, or we, we don't do that, or whatever. Bear with me this morning. We're going to, um, we're starting in a place and we're going to get all the way through. Uh, but, um, if anybody needs one, just, just get one. And um, so we're going to start here. And there should be enough for everybody. And um, I want you to think of some epitaphs. Uh, an epitaph is what is the good thing or the, the thing that would often be written on the tombstone of a person who's passed away. Um, with the dates and the person's name or whatever. So I want us to think of some epitaphs for, uh, for, or for, for the tombstones for biblical characters, okay? And we're gonna start with, let's start with one that we all know very well. We are gonna, we're not gonna stay here, we're gonna move on. But let's look at Abraham first, okay? Don't, don't click what's next. We know Abraham well. If you were the uh, tomb, if you were the epitaph writer for Abraham, what might you say about Abraham? He's long gone, more than 2,000 years now, long gone. What would you say, what would you write on his tombstone? Anybody? Pastor Renee. He believed and obeyed. He believed and obeyed. Very good. Okay, he believed and obeyed. Somebody else might see it a different way. Anybody else? Father. Man of faith. The father of faith or man of faith. Anybody else? Father of nations, that's right. Anybody else? Faithful? Faithful to God. Okay. What I wrote, but any of these answers is very, uh, is very fine, is very acceptable. I said, friend of God, because that's one of the, that's one of the ways that Abraham is known. So if I were thinking of Abraham, I'd, be, I'd say, okay, Abraham, friend of God, or the father of faith, or father of many nations. So there's one. Uh, we don't want men only. Let's, let's look at Esther. What if you were writing uh, an epitaph for Esther? By the way, I haven't put dates on there because we don't know the exact dates, okay? Um, if you were writing uh, for Esther, what might you say? Anyone? In the first service, somebody said, beautiful woman, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but as we know, the Bible says charm is fleeting, is deceitful, and beauty fades, right? So you probably want to write something that's more permanent than beautiful, right? Okay, anybody, what would you say for Esther? Queen, okay. You could say, what, sorry? A woman of courage, okay, not bad. A woman of character, okay, of noble character. Okay, Esther's sitting back there nodding her head. Uh, our Esther is sitting back there nodding her head. Esther, I hope those things are true of you if we write it on your on an epitaph for you one day, of course. Uh, as I was thinking about it, I thought of this one. She saved her people. Okay, that's not a, not a bad one. Any of these could be okay. Actually, this is not a bad idea when you're thinking of Bible characters. Um, I, was, I was doing this in the Philippines, but we did a lot of new, mostly New Testament characters, and we looked at a lot of different ones. Uh, how about uh, Jonah? A little bit different, right? 
Jonah, the Old Testament prophet. What would you say for Jonah? <laughs> he swallowed his pride. <laughs> that one's a good one. I, I like that better than what I wrote. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Jonah's a little more mixed, isn't he? Because we think, of the, we think of his disobedience in the beginning before we think of his later obedience. Um, uh, see, oh, wow, that one's a little bit tough, isn't it? So self-righteous. Okay. And he was, wasn't he? Here's this preacher of righteousness. Uh, you could say he's a great revivalist because Nineveh was a great city. Yeah. The Bible talks about how many days it took to go around the city. Jonah finally obeyed went and preached God's message and 100 percent of the city repented even the animals you say what at least the an the owners of the animals you go back and read you'll see what I'm talking about um, this is what I said for Jonah I know this is not uh, scripturally correct swallowed by a whale lived to tell the tale okay but in fact the Bible does not say whale does it the Bible so was, was, was swallowed by a great fish. So I don't want to preach false doctrine this morning. I'm just putting it that way. Okay? Um, the Hebrew version says a whale. The Hebrew version says a whale? All right, then. We're going to leave it just like that. <laughs> swallowed by a whale, lived and to by, tell the tale. By the way, mm -hmm. remark, Jonah was the first symbols of the, of the early Christians. Ah. Because he was, uh, like, swallowed. Uh -huh. and woke up, like, uh, after three days. That's right. Like Jesus. Like so Jesus. Was the first symbol of Christianity mm -hmm. in the beginning. Yeah. So Jonah, we look at that, you know, so many, and, and that's a good point. So often when we read, we often read, um, we only like the New Testament, right? How many of us, you don't like to read the Old Testament so much? Ah, I like the New Testament better. But the Old Testament, there's so many beautiful pictures of Jesus and um, that, are, that are seen in the Old Testament as well. But I want us this morning to look um, at a different one. We've, we've had a little bit of fun with this, and you have a blank one before you this morning. But I want us to look this morning at a biblical epitaph that still speaks to us today, and it's going to be the basis of what we talk about this morning. This comes from a sermon that Paul preached in a synagogue on one Sabbath in uh, the place that is now southern Turkey, it was Pisidian Antioch, it was a place that is now present day southern Turkey, and he was, he was preaching about Jesus, but he was preaching from the Old Testament because he was speaking to mostly a gathering of Jews. And so look with me at Acts 13, 36, this is from the NIV, and I want us to look and I want us to think about what David's epitaph might be. In Acts 13, 36, which is part of the message that Paul preached, he, he says, inspired of the Holy Spirit, For when David had served God's purposes in his own generation, he fell asleep. That's a Christian term that we still use today. What does it mean? He died. That's what it means. He fell asleep. He was buried with his fathers and his body decayed. Let's keep that up just a minute. But if I look at that, I think of something really wonderful for David's epitaph. I really do as I look at that. And I see something there for each one of us. And in fact, this first part is going to be the foundation of what we talk about today in Acts 13, 36. <clears throat> I would probably put, let's look at the next slide for David. I would probably say something like this. He served God's purposes in his own generation. He served God's purposes in his own generation. That's going to be our foundation this morning. And so, as we, we could say almost anything about David, there are many wonderful things to say about him. We might say, here lies Israel's greatest king. Um, we might write, what would some of you say? There's another verse that we love about David. What would you, what? That's right, a man after God's own heart. Remember a few years ago we did a study based on the life of David and, the, and it was titled, A Man After God's Own Heart. That's going to be, by the way, A Man After God's Own Heart comes from verse 22 of Acts 13. It's part of the same message. That's going to be part of what we talk about this morning. For me, this is what I would probably say. He served God's purposes, or purpose, singular, in his own generation because that covers the entirety of David's life. So this will be the foundation for us. So, this morning, 
uh, ushers, if you'll come forward again, let's look at the next slide. You have, we're going to talk about serving God's purposes in your own generation. So if you don't have something to write with, I told you this was going to be interactive, uh, grab a marker and then make sure you put the lid back on it. Would you take your tombstone and at the top of it, if you don't like the color you got, just borrow it from, your, from the person next to you, write your name, don't write an epitaph yet, write your name at the top of that tombstone, okay? Write your name, or you can use your own pen. If you have a pen, you can do that. If you don't like the color, borrow from somebody else, get a p color that, but just write your name. Uh, you can put the dates if you want to, but you know, you only know one date right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and frankly, and frankly, I'm really looking for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, so uh, for me, I'm hoping that there's no, there's no uh, second, second date on there. But most important, put your name, okay? So put your name, and then we're going to be talking about what type of spiritual epitaph, that's what we're looking at this morning, what type of spiritual epitaph would you want written on your tombstone, on a spiritual tombstone, if you will. And you say, well, I'm not there yet. Um, I'm not there yet either. But, brothers and sisters, the way we live now, the choices we make now, the things we do now, will determine what is written here. And so that's why we're looking at this this morning. We're looking at this this morning. So I want us to consider today serving God's purpose in your own generation. This is a short phrase. There's so much here that can be of benefit and blessing to us this morning. I like to think about how David lived and what God says about him. By the way, you're not going to write anything else for a while, so you can put the lid back on if you want to. We'll come to this again at the end of the service. If you think this is morbid, personally, I don't think it's morbid. I think it's a great way for us to look at our lives and to look at what we have done and how we can move ahead. It helps us when we look at the life of David and we look at what God said about his life uh, and the testimony of God, because this is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is not just what somebody said about David. This is what God inspired. This is how God looked at the life of David. And I'm, I want us to look at this this morning and consider it as we look at our own lives. Because most of us, if I were to say to you right now, serve God's purpose in your own generation, immediately you would start to think, oh, I'm not holy enough. Do some of you think that already? I'm not spiritual enough. I, I, I haven't gone to Bible school. Uh, I, does this mean I have to quit my job and go into full-time ministry? Do I have to give up all my worldly goods and live as a poor person? Do I have to go to another country and tell people about Jesus? We have all sorts of ideas about what it means if we're going to serve God's purpose in our own generation. But when we look at the life of David and we see that this is what God said about him, we see that that's not true at all. David was a real person. Honestly, brothers and sisters, I think if, we, if David were here right now, we would really like the guy. I really do. He was, when we look at what we read in the Bible about his character, about his personality, David had a, a, a winsome, uh, uh, wins had a character or a personality that drew people to him. Jonathan, the most beautiful picture of earthly friendship, I believe, in the, in, in, that we have in the Bible, is the picture of the friendship between Jonathan and David. Here he was, he was a real person, he was not a wimp, he didn't float around two feet above the ground really, really holy. He was a real person. He was more than a one-dimensional character. You know, sometimes we think, oh, they were just like this. Look at this, look at this guy, David. Look at this man, David. He was a warrior on one side. He killed a nine-foot giant, Goliath, um, about nine feet, with a, with a stone and with a slingshot. In another place, God empowered him with, bare, with his bare hands. So we have this part, and he was a warrior, a great warrior king of Israel. That's on one side. And yet, on the other side, what was he? 
musician. He was a musician and he was a poet, wasn't he? He was a poet. What do you think of when you think of a poet? You know, we kind of think of somebody who sort of thin and, and sit in their room all the time sort of writing things and sighing off into the distance as they look out the window and think and think noble thoughts as they write. That was not David. We look at this picture of David, a real person. There's something else we want to look at when we think about this. Was David a perfect man? No. We know about the life of David, don't we? We know that David fell Deeply, we know that he sinned greatly, and yet he got up and he kept on going. And the Bible says of David, God would say of David, he served my purpose in his own generation. So, what does his epitaph say to you and to me this morning? I think it says, first of all, that in God's plan, life has purpose. Life has purpose. Your life has purpose. You may feel my life is inconsequential. You may feel my life doesn't matter much to anybody. There's no real purpose to my life. But what I would say to you this morning is this. When we look at what God says in His Word, your life has purpose. Your life has meaning. The trouble is, so many of us, even as children of God, even as Christians who are following God and love God and, and go after Him, so often our lives are lived as if we have no purpose. Our lives are lived as if, well, what I do doesn't really matter. I'm just going to try to be a good person. I'm just going to try to do what's right. And what I would say to you when we look at what the Bible says is this. God has a purpose for your life. God has a purpose for your life. And it fits in with his great purposes. Because this says that David served God in his own generation. So God has a part and a place and a plan for you and for me. My question to, uh, to you this morning is this. How are you living your life? Are you living your life with purpose? Maybe your own purposes? Are you living your life in the purpose of God in your generation? We'll talk about what it means to be in your generation in just a minute. As I was speaking in the first service, I felt like the Holy Spirit brought an analogy for this to mind, uh, to my mind. And I think this is how we so often live our lives even as Christians. If you were to look in your pocketbook right now, Um, let's see. I didn't plan this beforehand, so I'm not. I don't. I don't think I have any small things in here now. I gave all my small things upstairs on the fourth floor for Family Fun Day already. I spent my tens and my twenties. I wish I had some tens and twenties, but <coughs> because I went to the ATM uh, a few days ago, I have a hundred in here, and I've got several five hundreds in here. So these are, we don't, I don't have any thousands in here. We don't usually do thousands very much. But I want, what I want to ask you is this. If you had tens and twenties in here, have you ever had a certain amount of money in your pocket and maybe coins as well, but I've taken my, most of my coins out already, and you didn't think about it very much, and you went through a certain number of days, and maybe by the end of the week, <clears throat> you looked in your in your wallet or in your pocketbook to pay a bill and there was almost no money in there. And it, like it was, it was like, oh, and then you look and think, oh, where was that 500? And the 500 is gone. And the 100, and the 100's gone. Okay, you have, right? Now, let me ask you this, honestly. How many of you have ever thought, if you've ever had the thought, somebody took my money? <laughs> How many of you have ever thought that? Somebody... Ah, May is raising her hand and Kim is pointing at her, okay? We have, right? Somebody took my money. That has happened to me two or three times. Two or three times. I remember one time I was taking a break. I was in Thailand, and you know Thailand's so cheap, right? So inexpensive there. And I was shopping, and I was, doing, I was eating on the street, eating street food and things like that, and I got to my last day, and I'd gone to a store to buy something, and I pulled out my wallet, and I had almost no money left. And my first thought was, 
somebody has stolen money from my purse. <laughs> and the reason I share that with you is because most of the time, almost always, when we think that, what in fact has happened? We spent it. We spent it without thinking. We spent it without purpose. We spent it with nothing to show for it. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Almost all of us have done that. Almost all. I've done that. And, and, and I thought, Lord, what, how, what did I spend it? And then I would think back through the week and I couldn't put my finger on what I'd spent it on until I sat down and started, oh, I got that and that and that and that. But I had spent it without purpose without plan. And brothers and sisters, what I, want to, what I want us to think about this morning as we look at serving God's purpose in your own generation is this. I think many of us live our lives the same way we sometimes spend our money. Yes? Yes. Without thought, without plan, without purpose. And when the money is gone, it's gone. You may go back to another ATM, but brothers and sisters, when our days are gone, and when our time is gone, and when our lives are gone, there's no spiritual ATM we can go to to say, hey, I want a few more days. I want a few more years. I want a little more time. Because we have a set amount of time on this earth. We don't know how, much, how long it is, and I, I'm not trying to be morbid, you understand. But brothers and sisters, I believe that's pretty much a perfect analogy for what we're talking about this morning. Are you living your Christian life the way you sometimes spend your money? Without plan, without thought, without purpose. And you come to some point in your life and you and I look back at the days that we've had and the years that we've had and the life that we've lived and we say to ourselves, what do I have to show for it? What have I done? What has, has come out of my life that is bigger than I am, that is something for God, that is something good? And we look at David this morning, and that's why I think David is such a, a great challenge for us in his life. David, ser God said, David served God in his own generation. And so my challenge to you this morning is, are you serving God in your own generation? Are you serving God in your own generation? And right now, you might think about your own life and you might say, no, I'm not really. You might say, I've kind of wasted my life. What you're saying about money, that sort of describes me. Well, there's a test right now that you can take to find out if it's too late. Put your hand right here. Do you feel anything? Take a deep breath. Maui says it's beating fast. Is something moving? That's right. Is something moving? Then guess what? You passed the test, it's not too late. Okay? If something's still moving, as you hear me say sometimes, as long as there's breath, there's hope. There's hope. It's not too late. It's not too late. And that's why we're talking about this this morning. So we look at his life and one of the things his life and his epitaph tells us is that life has purpose and our lives have purpose. Our lives have purpose. But I want you to think about David a little bit more this morning. David was Israel's greatest king, earthly king. We know that there's one day a greater king. But I want you to think about this. David was not God's first choice, was he? Was there a king before David? What was his name? Saul. There was a king before David. It was Saul. And if you go back, we won't go into it this morning. There's not time to go into that, but it's so instructive if you do. You go back and read uh, the early parts of Saul's life. Saul was a great choice for king. He was humble very humble when you read the early the early parts of Saul's life. He was from a very good family so he had the right background if you want to think about it in that way. Uh, he was physically outstanding if you want to think about it in that way. The Bible says that when he stood he was head and shoulders above everybody else. So there were, he was physically he was uh, he, he presented well if you will as a king. The thing is 
God doesn't care about these outer things. And God doesn't look at these outer things because very soon, Saul, who made such a promising start, quickly began to follow not God's purpose for his life, but he very quickly began to follow his own purposes. Saul wasn't a bad king. He really wasn't. But in the end, he was no longer God's choice. And the prophet Samuel said of Saul, if you had obeyed God, your family would have been established forever. But because of what you've chosen, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, because of your disobedience, I will remove you. And God has already chosen another one. God had already chosen David before David even knew it. Do you know why God had chosen David when Saul was disqualified himself? Because God doesn't disqualify. We disqualify ourselves at times. Look with me at Acts 13.22. After removing Saul, this is what God did. After removing Saul, he made David their king. He made David their king. And he testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. That's, the, that's where we get the phrase, a man after God's own heart. Now that's not the only place it says it, but it says it here in Acts 13, 22. He will do everything I want him to do. So God looked. We're talking about the purposes of God still. And what I want us to look at this morning is this. Where was God looking? At what was God looking? What was God looking for as he was looking? You understand when I say looking, God doesn't have to look. God already knows, but we're using human terminology. What was God looking for? Where was God looking? He was looking at hearts. He was looking at hearts. And that gives me hope this morning. And that should give you hope this morning. Because you and I can't change a lot of things in our lives, can we? When I was a young girl, I did not want to be a young girl. I wanted to be a young boy. I was so boyish, I didn't play with girls, I played with boys, I was on all the sports teams, I, I, and I thought, well, I want to be a girl. Now, I'm not talking about gender problems or things like that, you understand that. I wanted to be a boy. I thought, boys have more fun. You know, they, get, they got to play sports and when I was growing up, girls didn't get to play that many sports. Girls had to do other things, you know. These days, it's, it's not that way. But I couldn't do anything about that. And the reason I want us to think about this, God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. And God is looking, if you will. And if you will, I'd like to think this morning of the Lord looking at your heart and looking at my heart. Because there are things in your life and my life that we cannot change. The Bible says that David served God in his own generation. Okay? So I want to talk about what it means, his own generation and God looking at the heart. When it talks about David served God, God's purpose in his own generation, his own generation means, first of all, time. Okay? It does mean time, but it doesn't mean only time. It has to do with everything that was part of David's life. It has to do with everything that David was that he didn't have a choice over. David couldn't choose when he was born. Neither can you. Sometimes I wish I had been born a little bit later instead of in the 50s when I was born. I was born in the late 50s, but I was born in the 50s. Some of, most of you were not even born in the 50s, right? Some of you are looking at me in horror this morning. I was born in the 50s. I'd like to be born maybe in the 70s. I, that would be so much nicer. I don't have a choice over that, and neither do you. What about the country in which you were born? Are you happy with the country in which you were born? Are you glad to be the ethnicity that you are? Some, thank you, Stephen says, yes, he's very happy to be Ugandan, okay? But there are some times when we wish, I wish I'd been born in another country, yes? If I'd been born in another country, I'd have more opportunities. 
If I'd been born in another country, I could be doing this with my life instead of that with my life. That's something that some of us wish. Some of us wish this morning we had been born in different families. Have you ever wished you were born in a different family? Those of us that have been born into unloving, unkind families wish we'd been born in different families. Brothers and sisters, you don't have a choice about that. In God's sovereignty, you and I have been born as, a ma as male or female in the country, in the time, in the place, in the family, in the economic setting of the family, in all of these things, with things that you and I look at as this is how it is and it cannot be changed. And that's true. That's in God's sovereignty. Those cannot be changed. That's part of your generation. But there is something that you have a choice in. And you have a choice in your heart. You have a choice in what your heart is like. I have a choice in what my heart is like. God will not say, I'm going to give you this type of heart, Stephen. God is not going to say, oh, I'm going to give you a heart that is whatever. God will work with you. And God will work with me because I can't change my own heart either. But if I work with God, God will bring a change in my life according to my obedience, according to my desire, according to my will to follow Him. And so this morning as we talk about serving God's purpose in our own generation, lay aside the things that you wish you could change but cannot. And instead say, but Lord, here's my heart. And my question to you is, if God were here, if you could see him looking this morning, looking, looking for the man, looking for the woman, looking for the person who would say, God, I want to serve your purpose in my generation. That's what God is looking for. God is looking for the heart that is after his, for the heart that is like his. And some of us this morning, honestly, how many of you would, would say this morning, Pastor Jen, I, I like that and I agree with it, but my heart is so weak. I am so fallible. I am so imperfect. It can't be me. You're not describing me. There's hope for you this morning and there's hope for the, me this morning because we do not bring to God and come to God what we want to be and what we hope to be. Only God can do that in us and work within us. What we do is we come to God as we are. We come with our will. We come with our heart. We come with our choice just as we are, imperfect as we are, as fallible as we are, as weak as we are. And we come to Him and we say, here I am. Here I am. And that's what God is looking for. That's the type of heart God is looking for. And if that's how you will come to Him today, God will say of you, you are a person after my own heart. You are a person after my own heart. This is what God is looking for. And when we come to God in that way, God will say of us, here is a person who will serve my purpose in her own generation in her family, with her friends, with the things that seem to be limitations. Oh, brothers and sisters, we look at David and we say, what a great king, don't we? What a great king, the greatest king of Israel. We always talk about King David. If you were to look at the limitations that David had, you would say, oh, it would give you a different way of looking at David. The youngest son, there were, he was in a family, one of them died apparently uh, very young, was unnamed, but a family of ten children, two, uh, two sisters, eight brothers. David was the youngest, or the youngest, the youngest son, if you will. When Samuel came to visit in his hometown, David was not even considered important enough to leave the fields where he was taking care of the sheep. They thought of the others, but not of David. David was the youngest. Jesse's family, it's not clear to us, but it may not have been a family of great standing by the time that David was a young man. Um, think Saul's family was much, much better than David's family. The Bible's very clear about that. Saul, son of Kish, 
his family was a, it was a, a family upstanding, an upright family. God doesn't care about that because God is looking for hearts. God is looking for hearts. God doesn't worry about your limitations. We worry about our limitations. God says, give me your heart, and if you will give me your heart and all of your heart, then I can make of you, you will be a woman and a man who will serve my purpose in your generation where I've placed you, where I've called you, the family that I've put you in, the people that I've brought around you, the home in which you work, the school in which you study, the country in which you live. Oh, those things, that's where God has put you. That's where God has placed you. And for God, it's not a limitation. God is looking for a man and a woman that's after his own heart. After his own heart. Look at the next slide. I found David, son of Jesse, a man or a woman, after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. I talk with people sometimes who are scared to really follow God in this way because they're afraid they'll have to give up everything in their life except one thing. Now, when you follow God, God may indeed ask you to let go of some things. He may. May I suggest to you something? If God asks you to let go of something, and it may be a good thing, it is so that you may have a better thing and the best thing in your life. Long ago, I chose, God, I want your way in my life, and I want your purposes in my life. And because of that, I've had to give up some things that were pretty good, really, some pretty good things. But I've gotten better things. I've gotten the best things instead. And that's not a boast. That is the guarantee of God when we walk with Him and when we follow Him. He will do everything I want Him to do. Think again to what David did. Think again to what he was, a warrior, a poet, a worship leader. I like that one. He was, David organized the worship. The, the first, really, in the, he organized, he brought the worshipers together. The Bible says that those that he led and those that he arranged, they had to serve with excellence. And they were trained. And they were trained. That was what David did. And God inspired him to do that. David, David was all these other things. David was a great builder as well. When we look at and he was a great organizer. All, all of these things. All of these things that were part of David's life. Listen. Follow God and say, God, I want to be a, a person of purpose. Your purpose in my own generation. And let God work out in your life what is best to keep and what is best what is best to let go for his purposes for his purposes he served god's purpose in his own generation i love ephesians 2:10 look at the next one um, we know this verse so well the niv says for we are god's workmanship and uh, new living translation i think says masterpiece created in christ jesus jesus to do good works which god prepared in advance for us to do there are so many things that god has planned for your life and for my life but those things will not be accomplished those things will not be fulfilled unless i say god here i am use me for your purposes use me for your purposes they're good works and by the way when it talks about this if you look at the whole passage this is not just we're not just talking about something I'm going to do for God to be a person of purpose in God is also what he's going to make of you and what he's going to make of me in making us like Jesus and what he's doing in our lives that's part of it because God has to make us before he can work through us, before he can fully accomplish his purposes. But I love this picture in relation to what we're talking about this morning. For we are God's workmanship. You say, I don't feel like a masterpiece. How many of you say, I'm, I'm, I'm a disaster, not a masterpiece? If you're sort of a disaster right now, let God keep working on your life and he will make something out of your life that is beautiful and that is worthy. Do you know what the Greek word for this is? This word? For we are God's workmanship. The foundation, the foundation word of the Greek word that Paul uses here is the same word that we use. From that word we get the word poem. Poem. I, 
Isn't that wonderful? Out of that, God is making something beautiful and wonderful. And when we give ourselves, we are His workmanship, His masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus. That's the only place, brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus is the only place where something beautiful will be made of your life and of my life. It's only in Christ Jesus, which God, and the created to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I've told you those of you that have been part of the church, I've told you before one of the prayers of my heart that I believe the Holy Spirit gave me some years ago. And it's something I often pray, and it's something that you hear me say. For me, when I stand before the Lord one day, I want no regret. I want no disappointment. I want to stand before the Lord in full knowledge at that time and see that everything and every good work the Lord planned for me in advance to do, way back when, I've done it. I've done it. That there's no regret. That I'm not going to look and say, oh, I could have done that and I didn't do it because I, I wasted my time. I, I could have done that. God had that planned for me to do. And I didn't get that done either. I don't want that to be. I don't want that to happen. And so what I can do because I don't know all the good works, and you don't know all the good works. We don't know all the things that He has in store for us. So what we can do is say, God, here I am. Here's my heart. Make it like your heart. Give, make me a person of your purpose in my own generation, wherever He's called you, whatever He's called you to do. The great thing about this, because we're talking about tombstones, right? And we're coming to a close. Look at slide 12. When he'd served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep and he was buried with his fathers. You know what's great about this? When we serve God's purpose in our own generation, we need not fear death. We need not fear our end. We need not fear, I'm going to go too soon. We need not fear, something's going to happen to me and my life will be, un will be unfinished. That won't be. Of course we want as long as possible most of the time, don't we? I want to live as long as I can. But here's this beautiful picture. God served God's, uh, David served God's purpose in his own generation. And then, what? He fell asleep. He, he died. He died. And that, I believe, is part of the epitaph. That's part of the promise of God. When you and I serve God's purpose in our own generation, then God determines that we do what? We do what God wants us to do. We're not going to go a minute before God has for us to go. You know, whenever I get in an airplane, I know this sounds a little funny, but whenever I get in an airplane, I sit down and I kind of look around at all the people around me and I think, this is your lucky day. <laughs> because I'm pretty sure, Lord, I don't think I, I, I'm serving your purposes and I don't think you've come I don't think I'm at the end of my time yet. This plane's not going down. <laughs> I, I'm not trying to be arrogant. I'm really not. I'm really not. But I believe I'm serving God's purpose in my own generation. And when we are serving God's purpose in our own generation, then our lives are in God's hands. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about that. You know, when we come to this tombstone, we've got the start time, and then maybe there's an end time. We don't know when that end time. We don't know. And we don't determine that. God determines that. God determines that. But here's the great thing about it. We've come to a close, and it's time to come to a close this morning. Look at what Paul says in uh, slide 13. I wonder if Paul was thinking about that, because you know this was Paul's sermon. This was part of his preaching. He comes to the end of his time. He's in prison, um, or to put it in modern terms, he was on death row. He knew that. He was on death row. And he says, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. By the way, Paul's life was poured out as an offering to God from the moment he gave his life to God. That's why God was able to do such wonderful things through Paul, because Paul's life was fully God's. It was fully God's. But he says, the time of my death is near. Listen, how did Paul know that? Holy Spirit whispered it to his heart. Holy Spirit led him to understand that. Same thing for Peter. I want to ask you something, not being morbid this morning. What if the Holy Spirit whispered to you, to you this morning, the time of your death is near. Seriously, what if the Holy Spirit whispered that to you? 
what would your response be? What would your reaction be? <gasps> Maybe. Not yet, Lord. How many of us would say that? No, not yet. I, I still have things to do. I still have to do this. There's still this and there's still that. The life that is lived with God's purpose in our own generation will not be that life. It will be as Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me. The prize awaits me. So this morning, let's do the very last slide. We're going to close in prayer this morning. And you've still got the marker. You've got your name there. And we're going to pray. Stephen, would you just play? Maybe God, you are my God, or whatever's on your heart. And we're going to close in prayer. And I want to ask you, what is your epitaph? What do you want your epitaph to be? Pastor Nay, you told me. What did you say? T tell me. He said, I might change it a little bit, but I, I liked what he said. It may be a huge one. It may be several smaller ones. What was yours? Live for God a fulfilling life. Live for God a fulfilling life. I've told you what mine was, right? that I fully fulfilled all of God's purposes for my life. It might be a loving husband, a faithful mother, or a, it could be any one of these things. But I challenge you this morning, I challenge you as we close, and it is time to close. What do you want your epitaph, your spiritual epitaph to be? How we live now, how we choose now determines what that will be. Not good intentions is how you're living now. You can say, God, this is what I want. Lord, this is what I want. Work in my life. Work in my heart. Change what needs to be changed. Help me to stop wasting the days of my life as I waste money so often. Make my life count for you. Serve God's purpose in your own generation. You can do it. It's not too hard because this is where God has put you. Lord, we come to you right now and as we pray, you can just pray, you can write it later if you want to, but I, I, I urge you at some point to write, some, to write on there what God puts in your heart, what your desire is in God. And if, it's, if your purposes, if they're not really great, you can change them. Now's the time. Lord, we come to you this morning. We thank you for the days you have given us on this earth. We thank you, Lord, that you let us come into being, that you put breath in our lungs and blood in our veins, and that we are here today. We thank you that you've given us the opportunity to know you. Lord, there are things we don't even understand because, God, we know there are people in other countries that have had no opportunity to even hear your name whispered or preached aloud. And yet, your grace on our lives that we have had the opportunity to hear of you, respond to you, meet freely with brothers and sisters, Oh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for what you've given us in our lives. Thank you for our lives. Lord, this morning, I pray for myself. I pray for my brothers and sisters. May we be women and men who serve your purpose in our own generation. May we turn our eyes away from limitations. May we let go of regrets I wish I had. And instead, with what we have now, and the time we have now, and the heart we have now, and the choice we have now, we choose you. We come to you. We follow after you. Use my life for your purpose in my generation, not frittered away on useless things, on, on temporal things of this life that will never last beyond a few years but will bring something of eternal value of et an eternal weight of glory in our lives oh lord may we be men and women who serve your purpose in our generation just as david just as paul just as esther as abraham as joshua as peter 
as Aquila and Priscilla, as John. Oh God, here are our hearts. They are yours for your purposes. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.